Okay, the scripture says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, we can read the scriptures and we can see very few ever saw beyond the flesh to see that Jesus was not just a man. They, they saw glimpses. Now, when Jesus said, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Peter spoke up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Now remember, folks, this is the same one that denied that he even knew Jesus. So, we see that Simon Peter got a revelation. He got a glimpse. Does that make sense? Now, the scripture tells us that in the evening time, there will be flashes of light. There'll be light in the evening time. In these last days, there's flashes of light. We're coming to the knowledge of the truth. Now, if the Lord was to give you a revelation and you were to see a glimpse of who he was, would that be enough for you to go on and serve him? Would that be enough for you to continue in the truth? Absolutely not. This is why the scripture says we must continue in the truth. This is why we must continue in his word. He said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. See, this is what's not being taught today in the church. What's being taught in the church today is if you went to an altar and accepted Jesus as your Savior, you're good. That's it. You're good. You're ready to go. You're going to heaven. But the scripture, the truth is, is you must experience the truth every moment, every day of your life. You should be walking in the light of the truth constantly. Walking in the spirit of the truth. Walking in the spirit of truth constantly, all the time. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will lead you and guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself. Why? Because the spirit of truth, he comes to bear witness to what? Who's he coming to bear witness? Who's the Holy Spirit coming to bear witness of? Himself? No. The Father? Not altogether. He's coming to bear witness of the truth. He's coming to bear witness of the truth. Now, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, I am the truth. If you can't see beyond the flesh, if you cannot see beyond the man, you will never, ever, ever experience the truth. Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That's what Jesus said. In other words, Jesus was saying, unless you believe that I can save you, unless you believe I can forgive your sins, unless, I, unless you believe that I can do more than just something in the physical, you will die in your sins. Now what I see all through Jesus' ministry is I see different ones catching glimpses. They saw glimpses. Now remember, he walked in the fullness without measure. But it's God that makes known. It's God that unveils. It's God that reveals. And in these last days, God's unveiling his sons. Right now, the church is hiding or the man-child is hidden in the church. The bride is being hidden in the church. Hidden in the church. She's not the church. She's in the church. But God has yet to unveil her. She earthen vessel with this treasure on the inside. Even those that are the bride of Christ don't even really understand how bright they are because it's not them that's bright altogether. It's the truth that's in them that's bright. It's Christ in them that's bright. But if God was to allow us to see the glory, if God was to allow us to see, we'd probably fall into the same trap as Lucifer. We'd probably get lifted up. we get proud. 
My pastor said a long time ago, I remember him saying in a, in a sermon at a convention, in a revival service, he said, the three G's is what messes up God's ministers. The gold, the girls, and the glory. Now, I've had times where I'll just be quick, going by the mirror in the bathroom, just quick, not even combing my hair, just walking by, and all of a sudden I see this light, I see this shine. And it's very appeal. I mean, you want to go look at that light because it's God's glory, but you don't want to sit there and look in the mirror. You don't want to do that because you're still seeing you. Now, if you were looking into God's glory and you didn't see yourself anymore, that's, that's what we want. We don't want to see ourselves. And that's what the scripture says. Looking into the glory of God will be unchanged. But if you're looking into the glory of God and you're still seeing yourself, there's still that, that measure where you can still, like Lucifer, you see yourself. See, I believe that Lucifer, the Bible says he walked in the stones of fire, amongst the stones of fire, up and down the stones of fire. I believe that Lucifer saw himself in the stones of fire. And when he saw himself, that's when he said, I will ascend. That's when he started thinking those thoughts. That's when he started forming the, the thoughts and the imagination and that he was going to be like the Most High. And you think about it. What is it that, you know, women, they look in the mirror and they, they, they want to doll themselves up and, and put makeup on their faces and they want to look beautiful and all these things. Well, let me tell you, from a Christian's perspective, from a man's Christian's uh, perspective, I don't think that uh, makeup on a woman's face makes her look beautiful. In fact, I think it makes her look horrible. I think it actually covers up the real beauty. In fact, if God's glory was to shine through your skin, and your skin was to shown to be shown like it did for Moses when he was in the presence of God. What if you've got makeup on your face that's hiding that glory from emanating? It's hiding that shown. It's hiding that glory that should be shining from your countenance. I'm telling you, uh, ladies, and and I don't know. I don't ever do this. I think it's the first time I've ever done it. Maybe God would have just, there must be a reason. I don't know, but I'm going to obey the Lord. If you're, if you're putting makeup on your face, first of all, it's because you've been misdirected. But I'm going to tell you right now, and this may offend you, but putting makeup and jewelry on your body, that, especially makeup, is the spirit of Jezebel. Who was it in the Old Testament scripture that painted up her face? And why was she painting up her face? She was trying to uh, seduce Jehu that was angry with her. He came to bring destruction to her. He came to destroy her. And she was trying to flirt with him. She was trying to get him to be allured by her body, by her, by her physical beauty. Now, I never thought of Jezebel as being beautiful in the sense of the physical. Because when I read about her in the scripture, she's, to me, she's just ugly. So I don't care really how beautiful she is. It's like today, Beyonce, for example. You may say she's beautiful. I don't. When I've seen pictures of her, she is so ugly. I mean, ugly. Now, you may look at Oprah Winfrey when she's all dolled up and, you know, in that mystic uh, spirit and she's got her face with all that makeup. I'll tell you right now, folks, Oprah Winfrey would not be the billionaire she is today if it wasn't for that familiar spirit she operates through. If it wasn't for her Jezebel spirit and, and dolling her face up and, and putting that makeup on, she would not... Have you ever seen Oprah Winfrey without her makeup? That's not to down Oprah Winfrey. I'm just telling you, have you ever seen her without her makeup? Okay? She could stop a truck. Now, I'm just saying that because... You think that the image she made for herself is who she is. She will tell you. She has said in the past that when she, before she goes on stage, that a, a energy comes into her body. She gets possessed. Beyonce says the same thing. She gets possessed. Now there's Hollywood actors coming out saying they get possessed before they go into the movie and before they do their parts in the movie. Do you understand what I'm sharing with you? 
We need to get beyond the flesh. Now, the devil comes along to try to beautify the flesh, try to come along to allure the flesh, trying to get people caught up in the flesh. If you go to church and you're happy in your flesh, then you're not in the house of God. Let me say that again. If you go to church and you're happy in the flesh, you're not in God's presence. You are not in his presence. You cannot be in the presence of God and be happy in the flesh. You know, you know, you know how I know that? Because God is at enmity with the flesh. And the flesh is at enmity with God. So there's no way. In fact, it says they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So when you see people that are in the flesh and they're um, dancing, quote unquote, in the spirit, and they're in the flesh, those are the same very people you'll find that they're not happy. They're drawing attention to themselves. But if you find someone that's dancing in the spirit, that person also has the nature of Christ. And, and between the rock and a hard place, Christ is what's going to come from their life. Jesus is going to come out of their life. You're going to see Jesus. But what we're seeing today in the church is a show. We're seeing a form of godliness. But they're denying the power. You may see people acting spiritual. But the proof's in the pudding. And that's what we're going to find out in these last days. Everything's going to be tried as by fire of what sort it is. Now, you, what might be fire for you may not be fire for me. What might be a hard place for you may not be a hard place for me, and vice versa. But God knows what the hard place is for you. God knows what the fire is for you. He knows what it takes for you to reveal what's on the inside. Now, does God get pleasure out of exploiting or does God get pleasure in you being embarrassed before the world and them seeing you in an undone state? No, he doesn't get any pleasure in that. That's why he says, let me purge you. That's why he says, let me judge your flesh. How do you do that? You spend time in the word. You spend time in prayer. If we would spend more time in prayer and more time in the word and crucifying the flesh and allowing the truth to, to, to judge the flesh, then in the between the rock and the hard place, when we get in the hard place, we'd, we'd pass the test. And we'd be a light. And we would be a testimony to those around us. Amen? Isn't that what it's about? Isn't it about being a testimony to those around us? Isn't it about being real, being, living epistles, read and known of all men? Give you an example. How many under the sound of my voice? Now you be honest. You, 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 may, you may not want to be quick to answer this. But how many under the sound of my voice, if you was beaten with rods, would rejoice. Now you think about that for a minute. If you was being beaten with rods, could you rejoice that you was beaten with rods? Because we read in the scripture that when the, the apostles were beaten with rods, that they rejoiced, that they were counted worthy to suffer for Jesus' sake. I never heard of that before. I never heard that gospel before. That's because ministers today are tickling people's ears. They're not getting them ready. They're not preparing. They're not, they're not training them up. They're not building up the body of Christ today. They're not equipping the church. It's the truth that equips the church. The truth is that unless Christ changes us, we're all going to fail. 
It's the truth that makes us free. It's the truth that changes us. But if you think that you're strong enough to endure rods and you don't need Jesus to help you, then you're going to fail. Because there's not one of us that can endure rods or endure suffering like that and rejoice. Now, you may be able to endure those rods and be beaten with rods and not cry out even. You may be able to have that much man or much that much woman in you, possibly. I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna down you. I mean, it's possible. However, and I mean, there's soldiers in the army right now. There's soldiers in the special forces right now that are trained not to ever give up intelligence, no matter what they go through. They they are so trained and so prepared that no matter what kind of uh, pressure they're put under whether it's electrical shock, whatever it might be, when they get on the enemy's territory and they get captured, that they will not give up the truth. Now listen to what I'm telling you. There's more and more programs coming out today about, about people that are not willing to give up the truth. I just watched a program where this guy was willing to uh, swallow Drano and kill himself so that he would not give up his... Uh, friends. Are you listening? He would rather die than to give up his friends. He was already going to die anyway, but he knew that and he just wanted to make sure he was dead. He did not want to wake up in, in some interrogation room. Now, what I'm saying to you is we are coming right now into the new world order. We are coming into the reign of the Antichrist where the scripture says that there are going to be those that are going to be beheaded for the uh, testimony of Jesus Christ. So without question, we've seen down through all through history where Christians were um, put in positions where they were, where they wanted the Christians to recant. We just saw where this man in the Middle East was put in prison so that he would recant of Jesus Christ. Do you remember hearing about him? Well, he's out of jail now. And praise the Lord, he stood the test. He didn't recant. Amen? Praise the Lord, that is a victory. Amen, that's a victory. And I don't know how many Christians today could endure what he endured. We only know about the prison part. We don't know about what he endured and suffered. We don't know. We have no idea. Now, I just watched another program recently, um, the news, a video on YouTube that talked about the man that threw the shoe at George Bush. Now, you may not know this, okay? But the man that threw the shoes at George Bush, after they took him out of that place, the CIA, along with the Muslim leaders there, their CIA, I guess you'd call it, or their intelligence, took that man and they brutalized him. They tortured him. Okay? This is now just coming out after his release. They brutally tormented him all night long. Now, they were not trying to get him to give up truth. They were not trying to get him to, uh, to recant. They were, uh, they were punishing him because he embarrassed the nation, their nation. They, he, he embarrassed them before America. You understand what I'm saying to you? They tortured him. And they severely beat him. They severely, the electrical shock shocked him all night. He said this went on for two days. And it wasn't until his brother brought it to the knowledge of the media that they stopped torturing him. You got to understand, folks, there's people that are in this world that are sadistic. They enjoy seeing you suffer. Now, if this kind of message was shared with more Christians, maybe they'd stop playing church. Because more and more, this sort of thing is going to happen. 
we see in the scripture where this happened a lot in the book of Acts, where God's people were imprisoned, and we see a lot in history where we know about the, the catacombs, we know about the Nero's torches, we know about how human torches, Christians became human torches for the pleasure of Nero. We know that the, the papacy and how cruel the popes were and what they did to Christians, okay? We need to get beyond the flesh, folks. We need to get beyond the flesh. As long as we keep seeing Jesus in the flesh and we don't see him as the Son of God, look, he never cowarded once. Not one time did Jesus ever cry out when he was being, his back was being torn and the bones were protruding out of his back. He endured such punishment to, to the degree that, he, that Pilate said, Behold the man. He had seen many soldiers, or he had seen many under his soldiers being tortured. He saw them succumb and break down. But this man was different. To the degree that he said, Behold the man. Now, the devil would like you to believe through Hollywood and through false teaching that Jesus fell beneath the cross. That's hogwash. That's a lie. He never fell. The, he was not just a man. That was the Son of God in that body. If you don't understand what I'm saying to you, you're not going to make it. The reasons the apostles could endure the, the rods and rejoice because they were beaten uh, because for the sake of Jesus, the reason they could rejoice is because they were not walking in the flesh. They were walking in the spirit. You know why they were rejoicing? And this is going to offend you. They never felt those rods. That's going to that's going to offend you. You think that God takes pleasure in you hurting? Do you know what astounds the world? is when they're shot at with a gun, when a Christian shot at it with a gun and you can't kill them. You know, what's, you know what really makes the world angry? Is when a sword is thrust through someone and they don't die. See, we haven't been taught these things. This is going to offend the church. When you go to the church and say, the apostles never felt the rods. When you go to the church and say, Jesus never felt, not one time did he feel the pain when they thrust the the uh, the thing into his the the whip into his back. You know why? It offends the flesh. Why does it offend the flesh? Because the flesh wants to cry out. Because the flesh wants to say it has something in it. God designed this way into the such a degree he didn't want any flesh to cry out. He doesn't want the flesh to make a noise. In fact, it's going to come to the place the place in the scripture where the Bible says, quiet flesh, be silent. God hates the flesh. He hates the sound of it. He can't stand the sound of flesh. Are you listening, folks? Jesus never felt one whip. It's not the truth, the truth that makes you free. The truth that, uh, or I should say the stripes, make that you're healed because of the stripes of Jesus. It's not because he hurt. That's not what makes you whole. It's the truth that it happened. He took those stripes. He didn't have to hurt for them to heal you. It was the blood that heals you. It's the blood that came from him that makes you free. It's the blood that heals your wounds. It's the blood that came from his back. It's the blood that came from his brow. It's the blood that came from his side. It's the blood of Jesus that sets you free, that, that, that saves you. It's the blood of Jesus. What is that blood? The life is in the blood. It's the truth. When that blood and that water came out of his side, the man said, of a truth. He said, this was the Son of God. This is the Son of God. So 
So if you think for one second that God desires that you suffer in the physical, that he in any way that that's part of a test, somehow God is testing you to see if you will break under pressure, that's not what this is about, folks. This whole thing is about submission and surrender. If you won't submit and surrender, then you will endorse some things in the flesh and you will hurt. But God said we could escape all these things and stand before him. He takes no pleasure in you and I suffering. He takes no pleasure. You say, well, what suffering is he talking about when the scripture says through much suffering you enter the kingdom? What is the suffering when he says, um, Jesus says, if you're going to reign with you, you must suffer with me. What is that suffering about then? What, what's that suffering? The suffering that is about is uh, denying yourself when you want to justify yourself. That's suffering. When somebody wrongs you and you know you're right and everybody in the world saying you're wrong and you shut your mouth he opened not his mouth. He was obedient even unto the death of the cross. He was innocent, but he did nothing to try to let them know he was innocent. In fact, it was another man that said, I find no fault in him. Jesus didn't say, hey, I'm innocent here. What are you doing? He suffered it. Are you getting it, folks? It's time for the church to know the truth. One reason we don't go on the street, we don't share the gospel. One reason is because we're afraid. We're not supposed to be afraid. Jesus said, fear him who can destroy your body and soul in hell. Don't fear him who can destroy your body and afterwards can do nothing else. Look, we know of people that were burning at the stake and they were singing praises to God because they never felt anything. They didn't feel anything. What does the scripture say? I mean, this, this world has no power over the flesh. Does that make sense to you? Is that truth? Am I sharing truth with you? Or are you going to be offended and say, no, I've got to suffer. I have to suffer in the flesh because I, it's got to be about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's about truth. The truth makes you free. Look, I will never do anything for God that God would ask me to do. I would never go into harm's way. I would never go into places that are dangerous if I was afraid that I was going to hurt. One of my biggest fears, my biggest fears is being hurt. I'm going to, I'm going to confess that to you folks. One of my greatest fears is being hurt. But guess what? I don't have to hurt. You know why? Because Jesus makes me free. How does he make you free from hurt? By walking in the spirit. Mortality is swallowed up in immortality. Right? Isn't that what the scripture says? Death is swallowed up in life. The scripture doesn't say that uh, Stephen fell asleep. I mean, this, the scripture doesn't say Stephen died. It says he fell asleep. The scripture never says that Stephen cried out. In fact, Stephen didn't cry out. He said he did cry out, but when he cried out, he didn't cry out saying, I'm hurting. He didn't cry out saying, I'm suffering. He cried out and said, do not slay this sin to their charge. So you think that God somehow gets some enjoyment out of you suffering. You think that somehow that you have to suffer in the flesh and feel pain to be pleasing to God. That is the furthest thing from the truth. They rejoiced when they were beaten with rods because they never felt the rods. Can you can think of anything more to rejoice about? 
You're being beaten with rods and they don't understand why you're rejoicing. I'm rejoicing because I never felt those rods. I never felt the rods hitting my body. That is what God has for us, folks. That's the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. The world has nothing on us. The devil has nothing on us. We're free from the world. That's the truth the devil doesn't want you to know. Let them fire their guns. Let them fire their weapons. Let them do their thing. Let them sh throw their stones. They can't hurt us. But they can if you're in the flesh. If you're walking in the flesh, you are, you are open prey. Those stones will hit and they will hurt. Those bullets will hit and they will hurt. They will wound. But if you are totally consumed by the Spirit and you're walking in faith, you're dead. Your life is hidden in Christ. How can they kill you? How can, they, how can a dead man feel something? You're dead. No wonder Henry Groover is so successful in the Lord. No wonder his ministry is so successful. No wonder he can go into places everybody else fears to go. He walks right into some of the most dangerous places in the cities of New York where police are afraid to go and brings peace between the, the Mexicans and the blacks. He's already dead. Why would he be afraid to die? It's the fear of death all their lifetime, subject to bondage because of the fear of death. I'm telling you folks, God is raising up warriors right now beyond the flesh, beyond the veil. They're getting ready to be unveiled. What does that mean, unveiled? The veil is the flesh. So if they're being unveiled, what is it they're being unveiled from? The flesh. The flesh is being totally, completely removed where they're walking in the spirit. Do you have scripture to back this up? Yes. Read Joel. This army that God is raising up will not break rank. This army is not an army that's going to deal with flesh and blood. This is an army that's going to enter the spiritual realm and going to do battle with Satan. Is going to wage a war in the heavenlies. Folks, you got to understand the church is so infantile. It's unbelievable. It's like Paul said. Paul said, you're your carnal. You're babes. You're just little babies. You're carnal. You can't see beyond your noses. You can't see that there's a real warfare. There's a real battle beyond the flesh. Maybe walking in the flesh, maybe walking in this body, but we're not, we're, we're sitting with the, with the Lord in heavenly places. He didn't say we're sitting in heavenly place. He said places. In the Old Testament, he said, I'll give you places to walk amongst these that stand by. What is he saying? I will take you into the realm of the spirit where the angels, where demons are. I'll take you into the realm of the spirit where you can do real warfare, where you can see real change, where you can see real deliverance in the physical world because of the warfare that you're doing in the spiritual realm. See, the devil doesn't want the church to know this. He wants us to stay in the physical realm. He wants us to stay in the flesh. He doesn't want us to get beyond the flesh. He doesn't want us to get into the spiritual realm because he doesn't want us to deal with his kingdom. He doesn't want us to deal with the strongholds. Praise the Lord. We need to get beyond the flesh. And if we can't see Jesus beyond the flesh, we'll never get beyond the flesh. Because he's the truth. He's the one that strips away the flesh. It's the truth that crucifies the flesh. Folks, we'll never get beyond the flesh as long as we see Jesus as a man. We've got to see him as he is. He's the word made flesh. He's the son of God. They couldn't kill him. They could have never took in his life. You can't kill the son of God. And the only reason his body went in the tomb was because his spirit, the Son of God left that body. That's the only reason. He laid his life down. No man took his life from him. And while the church right now is sleeping, having their baby nap, there are warriors being raised up, a man-child warrior that's being raised up right now that is going to overcome the dragon. 
You see, Jesus, he didn't see in the flesh. He saw in the spirit. We have scripture to back that up. In Isaiah, he said, who is blind but my servant? He sees, but he doesn't observe. What does that mean? When Jesus would look, he would see people's hearts. He'd see their thoughts. He saw in the spiritual realm. When he saw people with demons, he saw the demons. He saw them in the people. He could see the manifestation of demons. See, Jesus saw in the spirit. He heard in the spirit. He walked in the spirit. Everything was in the spirit. But we've been walking in the flesh, folks. I've had tastes of walking in the spirit. I've had tastes of what it is to be in that realm. But I can't, I've never been able to maintain it. But the man child's going to. The man child's going to abide there. And while others are seeing fleshly activities, the man child will see beyond that. See the spiritual realm. See why this is happening. And be able to be like Jesus and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They don't know what they're doing. See, Jesus is raising up real peacemakers. We have a counterfeit peacemaker on the earth, which is the United Nations. Their police state, which is bringing in the world police, which is the United Nations, what they call peacekeepers. It used to be peacekeepers. Now they're called peacemakers. It's, it's Satan's counterfeit of God's peacemakers. But God has some real peacemakers. And they don't come to bring war and order out of chaos. They come to bring peace. Not peace as far as world peace, but peace in the sense of to remove strife, to bring the truth so people can be free, people can be healed, delivered. See, there's, there's a law that's beyond the law of this world. You're limited as long as you're living by the laws of this world. But there's laws in God's kingdom, principles in God's kingdom that are not subjected to the laws of this world. If anything, the laws of this world are subjected to his laws. But when the laws of this world are contrary to his laws, then we obey God. We don't obey man. And that's what Peter was saying when he said, we ought to obey God than man. Because what they wanted them to obey was contrary to God's kingdom, contrary to God's ways, contrary to God's word. We are men of God. We are ministers of the gospel. We are ministers. We are ambassadors of Christ. We are not subject to the laws of this world if they are contrary to God's laws. Does that make sense? I was told when I was first saved that I was going to be a warrior in God's kingdom. He said, you will see my Shekinah glory I'm sending forth. He said, many shall see my Shekinah glory. He said, seek my glory, my son, not your own. That was when I was first, the night I was born again. The night I was birthed into the, the night that I was born again. Those words were given to me. And then the next words I received was, Satan had desired to, to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I pray for you. You might say that I've been walking in the same crazy steps as Simon Peter. But now I'm in that place like Peter looking at you and I'm saying, consider the outcome. Don't look at the process. Consider the outcome of your faith. There's a process we all go through, but we're coming forth as gold. Amen? Amen? I remember hearing a minister one time, he came to the pulpit and he was preaching and he said, I just came out of the fire and I can't smell any smoke. He was fine-tuned. He didn't miss a beat. I mean, he, he was rapid fire. The word of God was coming out of him like fire. Now there's warfare to do in the spiritual realm. Henry Gerver, I don't know if he shared with anybody else, but he came to the church where I was going to Bible school and he shared some things that I have yet to find on the internet and I've yet to find on YouTube, anywhere. And he shared some things. 
And if you'd like to hear about those things, I'm going to share them with you. In fact, I'll try to find... I guess I can't find the audio to that. And I, I've yet to find anything on the internet. But if I can remember how the information goes, I will share it with you. How that he was in prayer and that God took him in his spirit and took him into spiritual places where he did spiritual warfare and where he bound a fallen angel. Well, it wasn't a fallen angel. It was a bound angel, I guess, or one of the one of the angels that uh, has a stronghold over a certain uh, city, and God took him in the spiritual realm. But I don't know. We'll, we'll see as the Lord leads. Um, I just know that that's where we're headed. We're not going to do warfare in the physical realm. This is a spiritual warfare. The weapons of our carnal are not, are not of this world. They're not carnal. The weapons of our warfare are spiritual weapons. They're not carnal, but they are mighty. We don't even really understand what that means. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Let me tell you some strongholds. I got four minutes. Tell you some strongholds over America. The Washington Monument has a stronghold. The Statue of Liberty is an unbelievable stronghold over the city of New York and over, over America, really. Um, there's other strongholds that are, are idols. You may not know this, but there was a demon in Dagon. And when the ark was placed in the same place where Dagon was, the scripture says the palms of Dagon were broken at the threshold. What does that mean? There was something in that statue that was trying to get out of that place because of God's presence. And that demon did not wait to leave that, to leave that uh, stone thing that he was encapsulated in. He tried to get out by moving, and, and as he was getting out of that presence of God, the, the, it broke at the threshold. When it fell over and broke, that's when the demon was able to get out. Remember, demons either want a body or they want a, a, some kind of a uh, something they can inhabit. And the Washington Monument right now, there is a stronghold demon in that Washington Monument that has an influence over that whole city. And you may not know that, but the Washington Monument is actually a sundial from Egypt. It's an Egyptian sundial. It's a male phallic, which is a male, uh, male organ. It, do I need to say more? Okay. And the sun is the female organ. And they believe in sun worship. And the Masons and the Illuminati, that's all sun worship. That's what goes on there. That's what they believe. That's what they're following. They're trusting in the shadow of Egypt. So these strongholds need to be broken. Before the Statue of Liberty can come down, the stronghold needs to be broken first. Then the demons need to be cast out. And I don't know altogether why God hasn't used Henry Groover to deal with that yet. Maybe he'll use me. I don't know who he's going to use. But he's been using Henry Groover all over the place, especially Japan, where he goes and he prays over idols and breaks strongholds. And uh, so I don't know who God's going to use to deal with the Statue of Liberty. But I do know eventually the Statue of Liberty is coming down. I know the Washington Monument is going to crumble. I know these things are going to happen because these idols have to come down first before God can even begin to try to bring repentance or judgment upon America to bring them to repentance. These idols have got to come down. You look in Old Testament scriptures, you'll find that God's prophets always brought down the idols first. Idols have got to come down first. Demons have got to be dealt with first. Strongholds have got to be dealt with first before you can deal with the people. And I'll leave you with that thought.